PBS Terra did a fascinating video on where the riskiest places to live in the United States are going to be as global warming continues. We have not done enough to stop global warming. We, we are assured with our current strategy that it's just going to get worse. With that knowledge, they did the math and found out where are the riskiest places in the U.S. going to be. Let me show you. These are the safest 10% of counties in the U.S. based on projections of how climate will change by the middle of the century. As the humid climate niche characterized by mean annual temperatures around 55 degrees Fahrenheit moves north, some places that are particularly cold now might actually get safer because, as we know from previous episodes, the most deadly weather in the U.S. is extreme cold. All right, now just one, one caveat there. So in that list of safest places, let me just give you an idea of, of how safe we're talking. You'll see uh, Michigan has, has uh, the west side of Michigan is, is featured there. Just under that, that lowest southern square, uh, on, on the west side of Michigan. Just under that is where I was a, uh, a radio show host. And one of my very uh, first jobs there was to cover the flooding happening in Spring Lake, Michigan. And similar to this, I had to tell people what they can do. I had to tell people where to get sandbags to protect their businesses. I drove around getting film for it, and there was, there was you know, parking lots flooded, uh, community efforts to stack sandbags, because Michigan has had uh, some, or Lake Michigan has had some of the worst flooding ever. We heard a lot about that on the other side, uh, re- so, excuse me, some of the highest water levels, which resulted in flooding in coastal communities. On the other side of that lake is Chicago, Illinois. We heard a lot about it from them. Uh, what we did not hear as much about was the erosion, because flooding, if you talk to the Army Corps of Engineers, as I learned covering this, uh, erosion or flooding isn't the only cause of erosion. High water levels are not the only cause of erosion. High water levels following low water levels are. And as a result of a year with one of the lowest water levels, followed by record water levels, followed by low water levels. In other words, global warming causing these uh, bizarre spikes. I actually watched a house fall into the lake because of this. So even though, even though you see safe areas here, it is talking very broadly. Because if you are by water, I'll tell you, global warming is going to become more and more of a factor in your life. You know from previous episodes, the most deadly weather in the U.S. is extreme cold. This ProPublica study also lists the most dangerous U.S. counties, and we'll get to that in a bit. But first, let's add to our map mid-century projections for flood, storm, fire, drought, and heat risk. Starting with one of the most local hazards, flooding. This map shows the number of properties impacted by future floods due to rain, overflowing rivers, high tides, and storm surge. Many coastal towns will be impacted by rising sea levels, and places like West Virginia will be slammed with heavy rain as the climate warms. According to Redfin, by 2050, 84% of properties in Cape Coral, Florida, and 98% of properties in New Orleans will be at risk for flooding. Houston is also an outlier on this list due to the sheer number of properties at risk, as we saw when Hurricane Harvey submerged the city under its record-shattering rains in 2017. But what about storms? It seems like these extreme precipitation events are causing more and more damage as the climate warms. The top 10 cities impacted by storms are mostly in the Northeast, but Portland and Seattle, both infamously rainy cities, also appear here. Now, let's look at fire. Here, the map shifts dramatically to the west and southeast. This map shows the annual likelihood of wildfire in 2050. 
The places most at risk of devastating wildfires aren't cities, but instead houses and developments on the edge of wildlands in places with lots of fire. And Man, that that shot. Let's see. And that, developments that on the shot edge right of wild, there. Wildlands this guy places. trying to tell his, just explaining to his kid what's going on. I, I, I wonder so much about that guy. What's he telling his kid? Why is he bringing his kid out there to show him this? Is he trying to show him that everything's okay? Is he trying to show him that, uh, is, he, is he trying to show him that, hey, this is, this is the consequence of X or Y? I mean, it's a young kid. I'm sure he's not talking politics with him, but breaks my heart to see that. And I, cert I, I certainly hope that uh, whatever conversation he's having with his kid about the gigantic fire outside their neighborhood is not one that uh, families around the world have to keep having. I hope we take this seriously. This is with lots of fire. And it's not just forested areas that are at risk, but also the grass and shrublands of regions like the Great Basin particularly places that are getting drier. Which brings us to drought. This map shows decreases in precipitation over the last 30 years compared to the 20th century. But what about the future? Well, here are the top five cities projected to be impacted by drought in 2050. Four of them rely on water from the Colorado River, which is already in a decades long drought and large water use cuts in the basin are inevitable. Lastly, let's look at the second most common cause of weather-related deaths in the U.S., heat. This map shows projected days over 100 degrees in 2053. Oh man, Florida, Texas, and Arizona are looking pretty toasty. Phoenix is hotter than anywhere else, but in Florida, temperatures don't need to be as high for it to become dangerous because it's also humid there. That makes it harder for the body to cool itself by sweating. If we take a look at the combined risk of all these climate impacts, we start to see how different regions will fare. And the Southeast will pretty clearly bear the brunt of climate change. And now let's add back in the data we looked at earlier, but this time for the riskiest 10% of counties. At this point, we're beginning to get a clearer picture of some places you might wanna think twice about before moving. All right, so let's just hold it there for a moment. Actually, let's get my dome off the screen. <laughs> Look at that. Look at where it is going to be the most dangerous to live because of global warming. I mean, Florida is covered. If you're talking about regions, oh my gosh, Florida, absolutely going to be a nightmare. And unfortunately, they're going to be the least prepared for it. Because Ron DeSantis will spend the remainder of his time as governor doing anything but taking reasonable steps to deal with this. Texas with Greg Abbott? Is he going to do anything to prepare for this? No. No, he is not. So these are, these are places that we know are going to require Steps taken ahead of time to counteract this. The, the uh, overheating, the drought, uh, the flooding, the, what we are expecting. And they are least prepared. Haven't heard much about Louisiana, but uh, uh, I can only imagine. If you want to take steps to prevent this uh, from, a, to prevent tragedy, in America. Show this to Republicans. Show this to Republican voters. Not me, because they're going to be hearing, all they'll hear is, is a guy saying Republicans bad, Republicans bad. For the record, Republicans bad. <laughs> but, uh, no, just show them the PBS tariff. That simple. You can frame it however you want to frame it. But uh, as in, 
uh, for example, frame it as, look, don't buy property here. It's going to be terrible. Appeal to greed if you must. But ultimately, yeah, make them aware that this is this now, it currently, has real-world consequences. Uh, watching a house fall into a lake sure did it for me. Uh, if, if you've got someone in your life who's voting Republican, just show them that. And you can even ask them, what do you think Greg Abbott's doing for his people in Texas right now? Privatizing more power grids, maybe? Ridiculous. There's also something you can personally do to directly affect this. And it will be a drop in the bucket, but hey, you get enough drops, you fill the bucket. Um, Give fossil fuel industries, including coal, including oil, give them less power. Give them less of your paycheck. Right now, you have to. You have to give people money who are, uh, you have to give money to people who are wrecking the planet. Because otherwise, you cannot drive. You cannot turn the lights on. But you can reduce how much of your money they get. If you have the means, install solar panels on your house. If you are looking to buy a new car, strongly consider getting a hybrid or getting a full-on electric car. I would, in terms of practicality, just right now, I would recommend a hybrid uh, because you are then uh, able to take a long road trip if you want. Uh, In fact, we had a viewer point this out. You're able to take a long road trip if you want, but for your daily driving, for your small trips where the majority of the gasoline would be literally burned, you can simply rely on the car's battery. It's also much cheaper. In the long run, it's a better financial decision for you. And the government will help you buy your vehicle. I have a link in the description listing tax credits. If you buy a car uh, that was made in 2022 or before, or if you buy a car, uh, or rather, if you bought a car in 2022, you want to get a little money for it. It was an electric vehicle. Great. Click on the link. If you buy a car now and onward, uh, there's a link for that as well, 2023 and on. The uh, reason for the two links is that the uh, laws changed slightly, but the the end result is the same. You get a tax credit for buying an electric vehicle. So save yourself a little bit of money and do what the, the governors of the states most affected by global warming will not do. Help their people out. Reduce the, uh, the hurt that is going to be brought upon these people. Uh, Real Bill P says, When I taught at VA Tech, I worked alongside the NWS office. They have been concerned for decades. Ooh. Sociology professors are including the climate crisis in the curriculum. Yeah, that's probably a good idea on uh, on their part. Um, At a minimal. At a minimal. At a minimum, uh, we should be preparing the next generation of, uh, of leaders and, and uh, industry participants uh, for what to expect. It's, it's going to get harsh. Surreal Edifice, oh, I love that name. Real, Surreal Edifice says they will dismiss this as fake news. Yeah, they will. They will. Uh, similarly, if you want a template for how say, uh, a Texas governor will act when their uh, privatization decisions end up uh, affecting their people. Just look at how Greg Abbott responds to the, um, the energy crisis in Texas. They have, a, they have a grid infrastructure, which is just terrible. And it, it got that way because Abbott privatized uh, their, their uh, electrical grid. Uh, what does he do? He blames uh, Biden. I have no idea how that logic works, but he, bl- he blames Biden. Uh, you're right. They'll keep on doing that. If uh, 
this stuff, however, becomes common knowledge. And particularly if we lay the groundwork now and we tell people about this stuff now, knowing damn well that it's going to happen within the next 10, 15 years. You make it part of the common conversation that we know where is which places are going to be hit worse. We can keep referring to that and do a very constructive, we told you so. So that hopefully, at the very least, hopefully uh, there is uh, vengeance taken at the ballot box.